Welcome everyone to our continuing series of interviews with past presidents of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Today, Bakitez John, the current president of ATSA and I, Amy Singer, the immediate past president, are interviewing Sarah Atish, who was the president of the then Turkish Studies Association from 1992 to 1994. Um, hi, Sarah, how are you? I'm very well. How are you, Amy? Nice I'm to see fine, you. I'm fine, thanks. It's great to see you. So the first thing that we'd like to ask you um, is how you got involved with the study of the Ottomans, of Turkey, of the Turks, um, and Ottoman and Turkish uh, cultures. Well, it happened uh, by my traveling in Turkey. I had um, lived for a year in Egypt. I traveled um, uh, sightseeing and Rome and Eastern Europe, and I had majored in art history and and uh, Near Eastern, what they called Near Eastern classical archaeology. So I had I was working for an art dealer in New York. I had vacation time, almost two weeks, and some money, and I went to Constantinople to uh, see Byzantine monuments. And while I was there, I uh, was very effective, efficient um, sightseer. And I wanted to go to Urgup and Göreme to see uh, more Byzantine uh, art. And I, I was the guest of uh, family friends who were in the diplomatic service, I guess, uh, Cecil and Mary Sanford. And when I mentioned that, well, I sort of like to venture out to central Anatolia. Um, Mrs. Sanford said, oh, Sally, you must go. The Turks will take wonderful care of you <laughs> and, and be sure to go to see they. And I did, and they did. I, I just uh, was so in, in, intrigued with the historical um, aspects of the landscape and the landscape itself and how uh, gentle and helpful and kind and not pushy were ordinary Turks whom I uh, encountered, little boys who would take me to show something, take me to see something that was locked. And I tried to give him a tip and he'd say, Vazi <laughs> you know. Just a, a really wonderful experience. And it was so beautiful that I thought, well, that was interesting when I went back. I will, um, with a beautiful Anatolian rug, looking at it, I will um, see if I can start studying Turkish. And Turkish happened to be given, given in the evening classes by Kathleen Burrow at, at Columbia University. And so that's how I started. So I studied, um, I had first year Turkish. There were two other people in the class, and one of them, Grace Goodell, said, hey, you're good at this. Why don't you apply for one of those NDFLs? I said, what? What is that? And she said, well, you know. And so I did. And I, I applied to uh, Columbia, which did not accept me, and to the University of Michigan, which did, because Ole Grabart was there. And I had not known <clears throat> of his father as a very distinguished historian of Byzantine art, and I thought, well, the sun's probably pretty good too. And so uh, I moved out of the art dealing world, which was interesting. I liked it, but I didn't want to do it forever. And, and that's how I got <clears throat> into the academic part of this. Wow. And um, can we ask who else was in your cohort at the University of Michigan? I assume you continued your Turkish studies there. Um, yes. Well, well, we weren't a multitude, you know, and that's one of the reasons that TSA and Mesa meetings were so important to, to get to one was a multitude. There was an MA student, Carrie Chapel. I don't know where he went. And then um, my other colleagues were in Arabic and Persian. Everyone but me was a, a Peace Corps returnee. And uh, in Turkish studies, I found that everyone but me was either Peace Corps uh, returnee or of an older generation. They had a connection with the Protestant missionary effort. Very fine people, but with a different perspective on things Muslim. So uh, I really was quite um, by myself, I guess. But really one, wonderful people. There was uh, Margaret Fury who did her dissertation on Mir Ali Shir Nevai. She had modern Turkish, she'd been in the Peace Corps, Ottoman Turkish, Chagatai, Hebrew, wow. and Persian. 
and she did not get the job at Penn and went to law school. Oh. So that was, a great, <laughs> that was a great loss. Yeah. And then there was um, three people in Persian studies. They didn't get jobs in the field either. Judith Cedarblom. These are the people who were the graduate student table, you know. Uh, Judith Cedarblom, let's see. Uh, David and Art Peterson. And uh, they went off in other directions. Likewise, um, uh, Ellen Irvin, whom I interact with a lot at professional meetings, um, did, well, she really wanted to stay in New York. That was part of the problem, but she did not, not get employment uh, that was suitable. She did an important dissertation on Adalet Aulu, and she um, uh, turned to computer science and worked for the state of New York with a lot of you know, brainy, interesting people. And so nothing ever came of that. So I would, there I was all by myself, really. And then um, I had a very dear mentor, James Stuart Robinson. Uh, Walter Andrews had just left as I entered in. And uh, Gernal Vindfor, who was in Iranian linguistics, and James Bellamy, who was in Arabic, uh, early Arabic poetry studies. And um, when it came time for me to think about, you know, job prospects, my major professor said, well, everybody has to tootle their own horn. <laughs> I didn't get any support at all, uh, you know, networking and, and stuff. It was, it was um, different in those days, I guess. This was, I finished my doctoral dissertation in 1975. And a um, student worker for my, one of my main professors said to me, hey, Sarah, why don't you apply for one of these? It was an ACLRS, SSRC uh, postdoctoral grant. My major professors didn't suggest that. It was a, a student who saw that come across Finn for his desk. And so I did. I had an important project, I thought, and I got it. And then they said, well, you can't have it unless you finish your dissertation. <laughs> so that was, you know, put the fire under my seat and I did. And that's what kept me in Turkish studies. Uh, that support from, I think actually was Nori Alman who really, do you know of him? He's an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. He said he fought tooth and nail for my project. <laughs> and that's how I stayed in, stayed in the field. And then, um, do you want to hear? Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, you said at Michigan at the time, there were not a lot of people who did Turkish. Uh, but So then uh, I imagine you had also some experience in Turkey that helped you uh, find the, how did you find your topic, the dissertation topic? How did you come to that? Where, did you have a uh, sort of a maybe advisor or mentor in Turkey who suggested a topic to you? How did that yeah. work out? I remember you, uh, your interest in uh, Tantunar. So how, how did you stumble upon him? Uh, it wasn't exactly stumbling because I, I wrote that in the, that silly overview that, to be an underpinning for this. Uh, I talked my, um, the center, center for the, it was a federally funded center for um, Middle East studies into letting me take my NDFL to Turkey in 1970. And there I went to the University of Istanbul and um, studied with Professor uh, Mehmet Kaplan. And I actually, I, I told him, I, he, unlike other people, he didn't ask me, why are you interested in Turkish literature? He just asked me where I'd been in Turkey. And I told him, I said, well, I went around with Herodotus and Xenophon. He said, well, for heaven's sakes, you should be reading Besh Shahir, Tom Pnar's book. So I <laughs> So I read that and I thought, wow, this is quite interesting. And at that time, I, I liked that kind of poetry as a poet. And I had um, benefited from a readings in a Turkish language course at Michigan that included something with Tom Pinar. So, and then the um, uh, Iranian linguist, linguistic specialist uh, was intrigued with the possibility of my uh, analyzing some of those stories in a very trendy, hip, hip, hip way. 
in those days. And so that's how that happened. The SSRC project was totally different. That had to do with fiction and ethnography in Turkey. I was really incensed at the way intellectuals were taking at face value what Fakir Baikort and Mahmoud Makal were saying about villagers. Because I I'd spent a lot of time interacting with villagers and they were, it was just so uh, scornfully condescending and just, you know, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't something that should be left un unattended to. And so I had a big long-term project on that, which I kept trying to turn into a book um, because uh, that's what it needed to be. But I ultimately just opened it up as uh, teaching as courses because I never was able to get the time and the space um, to do serious writing on a big project like that. Uh, because I was, I, I should tell you how I got this job at Wisconsin where I've been very happy. I'm not, not really complaining. Um, it what was done this way. I had a letter of recommendation from introduction from Oleg Brabar. And I had spent time in the um, Orientalist from British Museum and then in Paris. And then at the Uchinji Ahmet Tutpanese, I just took that letter of <laughs> introduction and and Philip uh, Sanam would bring up, have brought up anything I wanted to look at. So when I, sorry, I'm rambling off on a little sidetrack here. When I um, mentioned to, I guess it was Bruce McGow uh, McGowan at Arit, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm looking at manuscripts. He said, how did, you how did you do that? There were different ways of doing things, um, as they say back then. So uh, I was taking a, a break from doing some rather intensive stuff, uh, which included going across North Africa. I'm sorry, I'm combining two trips into one. And, and then I took a, a flight to Athens to then fly or take a boat to Turkey, but there wasn't anything on a Sunday. So I was uh, taking it easy on a, one of these boats that goes around the Greek islands. And this older man kept following me around and want, clearly wanted to start a conversation. I finally thought, come on, Sarah, you can be polite. He, he's lonely, he wants to talk to somebody, talk to them. So I did. Well, it turned out it was Menachem Mansour. <laughs> And we knew, we knew all the same people and got, really hit it off and had a wonderful time. He invited me out for dinner and I introduced him to Retzina, which he didn't like <laughs> with, with dinner. And then uh, that was 1968, I think. Then 1974, before I'd finished my dissertation, uh, he ran up to me at Middle East Studies Association meetings in Boston and said, hey, Sarah, <laughs> Kemal Karbat's here, go get him, go find him. He's trying to start a Turkish position, Turkish Lang and Lit. You gotta go, it's Madison so beautiful, there are the lakes and everything. So because I've been polite and willing to speak to somebody who clearly needs someone to speak with, I got a lead into, this, there might be a possibility of an opening in Turkish studies newly created by Kemal Karpat's efforts. So uh, I found him. I don't know how I had the nerve, you know, I just, I found him somewhere and I told him I was interested in knowing that he was working on this and, and uh, he gave me his card or something. Then I called him um, uh, because my mother had made arrangements or had asked that I be invited um, to my sister's in-laws in Madison, Wisconsin for Thanksgiving. So then <laughs> I, <laughs> I uh, telephoned or wrote Professor Karpat and said, as it happens, I'm going to be in Madison for Thanksgiving and I'd be happy to come in for an interview, <laughs> which I did with my husband and two-year-old daughter or whatever at that time. And then uh, the next year, uh, 95, I mean 75, I got um, a letter, an announcement or a phone call or something saying that they were working on a position and it might very well happen and um, I should be ready. I'd already sent my CV and stuff. And then it would be a two thirds time lectureship in South Asian studies. And that's, uh, that was the toehold I got. 
and there was a possibility of one third uh, time, part time in comp lit. So I was interviewed by everybody in the comp comparative literature department. I was going to give a really neat course on the Islamic illustrated book. Um, but that, that part department was having very difficult times and, and that didn't work. And the dean wasn't in favor of it anyway. So after th three years of one term, one term appointments, teaching all over the map, uh, I finally got a tenure track position, associate professor, uh, assistant professor. So it was a long, hard pull to get in there, but you know, I did it. And then I was responsible from 1976 until the department was reorganized in 2000. I, you know, I taught all four levels of Turkish. I, I did not have access to teaching fellows. <laughs> in addition to so-called so content courses. So, you know, I, I guess I was young and strong and able to do all that, but it made it not um, possible when I had one year Rockefeller Fellow at Michigan to get that book all done up. Uh, just didn't happen. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> and now I'm, I've moved on to other things. So yeah, it's a shame, really. Um. I'm going to ask something that's not in our list of questions because just now you told us so much about how difficult it was to create a modern Turkish position uh, at a major research university. I mean, this is something I, I, I study more history, so I, I don't have personal experience with literature positions, but um, I, I do. Uh, sort of try to follow up what is going on overall in the American academia. And it looks like Arabic literature and Persian literature, um, and um, I would say even Hebrew literature have a little bit easier time to find a location in universities uh, than Turkish, it sounds like. Um, to this day, I happen to notice because there is a comparative literature graduate students who wanted to do Turkish. And so I'm working with her, um, you know, modern Turkish novels, etc. We did one reading course last quarter. Now we are going on. And so in order to do that, I had to do some um, research into what is published in English, etc. And the, the area seems to be relatively thin compared to uh, modern Arabic, modern Persian, etc. Do you have any sort of institutional a uh, sense about how this came to be? Is it, I mean, what, why do you think it is that way in your own experience of having worked at Wisconsin Medicine? Uh, did, can you tell what it is that makes Turkish? Is it because it doesn't matter, that it's not spoken as widely? Is it, what is it? Uh, well, it's partly, you know, uh, Arabic is the holy, you know, source and important and Persian is, has this, um, atmosphere around it of, I don't know, uh, elegance and very positive kinds of thing about Persian, don't say Iran, but Persian poetry. And Turkish, unfortunately, I think it's part of the um, unfortunate biases that make it not appealing um, for students. We, I, I will say that my department finally after all that work, Languages and Cultures of Asia, and I had graduate student teaching assistants and things were taking off. And then I saw that I, when I retired, I was not gonna be replaced. And then I saw that the department was being dismembered. <laughs> so it doesn't exist anymore. And Turkish is taught. Yeah, it, no, I was, it's a tragedy where my way of thinking, I mean, it's not, not just Languages and Cultures of Asia, other depart, small Lang Lit departments of you know, even French and German in other institutions have faced this. Um, Turkish is taught now by a talented person who did a dissertation on Orhan Pamuk's Orientalism, I think. Um, Nalan Erbil, she's, uh, you know, an adjunct lecturer in um, the Department of German Slavic, no, German Nordic Slavic, and Central Asia or something like that. 
So, and the other members of my department wiggled into the history department or they slid over into uh, Asian Lang and Lit. Yeah. So it's, I can't help you on that one. <laughs> I mean, it seems to be also that it's, I mean, there is a, there are, I guess, trends so that um, East Asian languages are now extremely popular enrollments in East Asian studies generally have exploded uh, and not just in the US, but I also wonder in the US whether there isn't um, an element of heritage speakers combined, I mean, for Arabic certainly combined with um, the importance of learning Arabic for people who are interested in Islam, either as a personal um, mm -hmm. commitment or as, a, as an intellectual choice. But I, my instinct, and it's only instinct is that the demand from heritage students for Persian and Arabic is still running higher than the demand from, um, from any Turkish heritage students. Um, but that's just an impression. What interested me most about the biography that you described in terms of your job trajectory was the extent to which I would say your informal networking and a little bit of luck an enormous amount of persistence actually Thank you. No. <laughs> also but ultimately brought you to a job which in the beginning wasn't a very stable job situation which ultimately became more stable and although the networking certainly works very worked very differently then than it would work now where you would do the entire thing sitting in a chair um, yeah. The networking is certainly important. And you had alluded to something earlier in your remarks where you talked about MESA meetings. And I wondered from what point in this whole trajectory were you actually able to attend MESA meetings and what role did that play in terms of you know, bringing you contacts and, and connecting you? I mean, even at that time and specifically with respect to Turkish and Ottoman studies. Yeah, well, the, the, the Turkish Studies Association was, you know, fabulous place to meet people who, you know, suddenly you became a multitude, you know, people knew what you were talking about and the same things. And uh, it was that um, many people there who were, you know, on the East Coast, West Coast. Um, uh, and I started going to Mesa meetings uh, in 19... Mm. Well, the one I remember most clear is uh, uh, 1974, but I had gone before that. Um, and they were very important um, because that's how one met uh, people in your field. I mean, even Walter Andrews, who came out of Michigan, I, I didn't meet until I met him at Mesa meetings. <laughs> and were there, I mean- Bill, Bill Hickman, people like that, you know. Uh, there was a um, Peachy, I think it was William Peachy. I don't know what happened to him. He was an Ottomanist and um, Feldman. Um, brilliant young man, just so interesting and interested and generous spirited and all these things. <laughs> so and so these people I would meet at the Mesa meetings. And we all, I mean, there would be clusters and the T Turkish Studies Station was very um, important in that respect because they usually were panels. The, one at least or two, you know, that have been organized by TSA. Do you remember your first interactions with the TSA crowd? Who well, and... because I'm on the same ca campus as Kemal Karpat. I heard a lot about it because he was, um, and I, you know, I've, I, I, I've interacted with all of the um, presidents preceding me, except for uh, Stanford Shaw, who uh, was president of TSA, but I was on the board, but one year I couldn't go to Salt Lake City because of a family emergency. And the other, I just don't, I don't remember him, but um, dear Kim Abe was quite exasperated as I was expecting, you know, Stanford to do something. He hasn't done anything about reaching out to these, or, but that was the year he got a firebomb thrown at his front door. And no wonder <laughs> it wasn't getting Kim Abe Karpat's um, uh, uh, ideas about interacting with establishing relationships with Slavic studies, um, Balkan studies, 
Russian, uh, Russian and Central Asian studies. He, he really um, wanted to see that happen. And I'll have to say that that was the underlying motive and it was a very serious purpose in the founding of TSA uh, to you know, bring my documentary evidence because I knew I heard this over and over again. In this um, November 1977, number three, Turkish Studies Association Bulletin, um, he says, there, uh, I would like to bring to the attention of the Turkish Studies Association members a serious matter connected with the development of our field of study. One of the key purposes behind the establishment of the association, and you will find Howard Reed and, uh, and Silhouettes saying, and also Kathleen Burrow, that it was Kemal Karpat who was the founding pushing force behind getting uh, this organization started. And his purpose was establishing working relations with those areas. Uh, there's the obvious fact that all research dealing with the Middle East and North Africa in the 16th to 20th centuries uh, with South, South Europe, the Balkans, the Slavic, as well as Central Asian studies is related for historical, cultural, and linguistic matters to Turkish studies. And he goes on about, this is why we, we need to reach out and make connections with these other organizations. And uh, granted, um, Arabic studies, Persian studies, and Turkish studies all got going at the same time. And they were all um, dismissed as a group from Mesa saying, you can be affiliated with us, but not an integral part of our uh, association. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, we, we, you, that's in, interesting that he made that push. I guess, I guess there's something to be said about it. We, we do operate when we institutionally under Mesa's wings, our annual meetings are um, at Mesa. Oh, yeah, it was just that wouldn't be amalgamated into the organization, that's all. Right, right. No, no, what, what I'm thinking, what I was going to say was, and that kind of situates us institutionally more looking south uh, and, mm. sort of like, you know, to the Middle East and North mm. Africa, and not so much north uh, to mm. the Balkans, Eastern Europe and mm. Russia and East Central Asia. So the, I guess there is something to be said about this, although, of course, as individual scholars, it's uh, different. We, many of us operate in departments of like history, for instance, where you do interact with colleagues who do uh, different histories. For instance, in my own department, I have a colleague who does Russian history, who's interested in Central Asian uh, history, with whom uh, we are considering to have graduate students whom we would advise together, etc. So in, in de depending on when you where you are, the kind of things that Kemal Karpat would like to have accomplished, I think, are getting done. But mm -hmm. institutionally, that is a good point uh, that uh, sort of we are always meeting with people who study what the region that is kind of like where the Ottoman Empire and it's further south, but not so much going north. And that might be that might be something we perhaps could uh, think about whether there is something conscious we could do to facilitate more, uh, you know, what about Habsburgs and Central Europe? What about Russian Empire and Central Asia? Mm -hmm. A little bit more. That's actually not a bad idea. I and think. it's good to be in a disciplinary department like, you know, history, or I'd hope to be in comp lit uh, rather than area studies. And uh, actually, Kim Alkarpat, may he rest in peace, uh, did accomplish that on the UW campus of having a Middle East studies program that was very practically oriented. Um, so that there were social scientists and climatologists and um, somebody in the law school even on the, uh, on the board from time to time. And uh, also with Central Asian studies. And he, in order to get the Dean and the history department to accept all this, he, I'll never forget, he cooked himself a wonderful dinner and invited all the key figures in the history department and the Dean and me and he got his colleague, Maureen Mazawi, to bring her. She said, he called me up and said, hey, wait a minute, I don't have enough silverware. I don't have enough plates. Can you bring some over? And he cooked, uh, he was a very good cook. He cooked, um, I think it was sea bass, it was some kind of fish, just done perfectly and a wonderful salad. 
and I think maybe there was <laughs> soup, and he, then he got his way <laughs> in getting the Middle East Studies program established. And then there was similar effort on his part to get Central Asian Studies program started. And um, that was a long story too, in the late 80s of finding a faculty for that. We won't go into that here, but didn't quite work out, yeah. I, I had a chance to meet him uh, in college. He had taken a year off, uh, I guess sabbatical, and had come to Turkey. Uh, I think it was 92, 93, so early 90s. And, and uh, I was an undergraduate student at Beacon, so he was giving a seminar, graduate seminar. I signed up for it. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Um, he would talk three hours straight. And still, if, if he didn't leave, if he didn't have to go, he could continue talking. He had so much to say and really bring, uh, you know, for an undergraduate student, it was amazing. The, the social, it was more of a sort of sociological, political science perspective on Ottoman society, Ottoman history. Um, I, and he had things to say about each and every period, uh, although it was more on the late period. I, uh, it, it was, he, his personality was very, very compelling, very sort of it, it always, I can imagine how people could be attracted to him just to have a conversation. It was such a such a lively uh, man, and and his story was also very impressive. You know, an immigrant from Romania to Turkey, then to United States. Um, so that, it must have been amazing to have worked with him. And I can imagine how he would be kind of pushing for what he wants and oh yeah indeed <laughs> uh, and getting it done uh, and not always getting it done but at least giving it a try <laughs> and some uh, often getting oh. it done. Uh, so that, it, that's how i guess the association first started thank you for giving us an opportunity <laughs> yeah. to remember yeah well there's there's documentary evidence these I, I, the other thing in addition to going to mesa meetings this little this is the bullet bulletin but you know when it was just even a newsletter that was so wonderful to receive that and be able to read and find out you know, there's a bibliography and what Turkish person scholar was visiting in the United States this year and um, uh, very good articles. I mean, it's not to be dismissed those early to the bulletins even. I mean, they, they really, I, I have, I don't have a complete collection, but I have quite a few. Oh, and then there's this one that bring this up. Um, the spring 1997 Turkish Studies Association, beautiful book. Bulletin has in it um, an article, a section, uh, the Turkish Studies Association at 25. And there you have uh, people who were involved in the setting up of it. Howard Reed, is that his name? Uh, Kim, Kim Alcarpat, Kathleen Burrell, who gives a very detailed uh, account of exactly what happened when. So I recommend that to your attention just for the, the background of it is very, very interesting. And you can get it, it's in JSTOR. Right. Um, the whole thing is now available. Um, going back to the first newsletters, Nuket Varlik, who's the present editor of oh. JOTSA, um, made sure that ultimately the entire sort of archive of publications beginning from the newsletter and all the way through. Oh, good. Is available. Wonderful. So I can throw these back. <laughs> well, that's up to you, but. No, um, no, no, look at my, <laughs> look at my basement. <laughs> so, so was it, I mean, it sounds as though it's likely to have been um, Kemal Bey who actually um, brought you to the point where you were more and more involved in the organization ultimately became president. Can you, do you remember sort of the timing of it and, and how you, you know, sort of worked your way into the job and what things were on the agenda for the organization at the point where you stepped in? Well, uh, I, th I think I had been on the board for uh, two years before that. So I was sort of up to speed on what was not being done. <laughs> And, and not a lot until uh, when Howard Reed or whoever it was got a very handsome letterhead and one could write more authoritative, more authoritatively. I know that um, 
wasn't composed by me, but a group of Ottomanists uh, wrote a letter uh, to the powers that be in the Turkish administration about easing the access to the archives. And that was written on Turkish Studies Association letterhead with a list of the previous authors and stuff. And that simple kind of act of having a letterhead in those days was, was very helpful, I think. I don't uh, know whether that letter in fact helped ease uh, access um, to the archives, but it, it was a major issue of discussion um, uh, when, I was, when I was president. And I, one thing I was concerned about, uh, that was uh, coincided with Madeleine Zilfi um, being editor of the journal. Uh, she did a marvelous job. That was one of the first leaps up. Uh, but there were, and that was when email was just starting. I mean, like, excitedly, I think it was the meeting in Oregon when we were exchanging email addresses and uh, all kinds of uh, complications <laughs> about uh, being able to keep in touch with each other. Of course, you know, we used to, of course, have phone conversations, but you don't have a record of phone conversations unless you're being naughty recording them. So there was um, a little uh, concern on my part about the uh, communication line between the treasurer and the editor of the journal, on which um, uh, it got straightened out. We don't need to bring that up. But it does bring up the issue of, um, uh, of institutional memory, for one thing. Uh, you know, that if I, I hadn't, and I didn't emphasize that this is, this was set up as, as a um, nonprofit organization that can receive tax exempt donations. And I, and I still get every year, somebody in Wisconsin needs to um, be mailed this. It can all be done online. I hope it's been done for this year. <laughs> uh, so I have not been doing, I have not been for, forwarding the notice of annual report filing requirement. Um, I've been doing this for years. And we had a discussion, Aki, about that. Right, I believe our treasurer takes care of it. When, when you brought it to my attention, um, I emailed uh, Patricia, who was our treasurer uh, up to the end of last year, and she said she does it online. So I imagine yeah. she would have instructed our new treasurer, um, David, to continue that. But I will remember uh, yeah. you made because it's your address. Uh, so you are uh, the, the sort of institutional formal address of our association, as I believe your home <laughs> address. So uh, we, we uh, might want to make sure we remember that, we keep that, and then if it needs to change, uh, we be aware and change it to a different address. In this, because I believe it has to be Wisconsin, unless we go ahead and reincorporate in a different yeah, state. It was incorporated in the work. state of Wisconsin, and Kemal Karpat went to that first meeting <laughs> with all the documentary studies, just went ahead and did it. But uh, it has always been sort of a concern to me because uh, the current officers have to sign the document or take care of it. But the, the report filing requirement thing needs to come to a physical address in Wisconsin. I'm yeah. happy to do this, but you know, I'm an official octogenarian now, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'll get into the nanos. <laughs> Inshallah, so, we will, and, and inshallah. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. And but then, of course, it could keep coming to this address, even though I'm no longer here. <laughs> right, right. We'll identify a, a, another Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsinian uh, and see whether uh, it, a new person could become the uh, a person of uh, physical contact for the future. I'll, I'll, I'll remember that. I think yeah. it can't be a post office address. I found that out. Uh, post box. I mean, a post box. What, right, what are they called? Post office box. Yeah. A post office box. No. Yeah. Uh, so I, this is what I mean about institutional memory, because I don't think Amy, you knew that uh, this is a, a tax-free donation. So for fundraising, and we, when I was president, we, as you know, started the uh, thanks to Nathan Altshuler, um, the Holiday Deep Aldivar Prize, uh, and. Uh, other other prizes so there's, there's you know 
money that needs to be uh, kept track of the fiduciary concern and also ties in with institutional memory, of course. And um, so, especially if the TSA gets an endowment program going, which uh, I, Carter Finley was talking about, that's such a good idea. Right, I actually- Because was, people uh, make donations to that and some of them eventually might be a rather major donation because it's tax exempt. I, I was planning to check on that tax exempt status because we are now at a moment when we need to do our fundraising thinking. I'm glad you brought it up and you're saying you're confident that it is tax exempt, people, donations to our association. Yes. Because of that document. So that's yes. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And th that we used to send out a, um, um, a an, well, we used to, I mean, one year that it was effective. Uh, saying, if you'd like to, in, in addition to your dues, here, check this box to make an additional contribution to the Holiday Deep Audubon Fund. And I know um, someone set up an endowment uh, for a prize best student in biology at the college where my father taught. And people, even for at the end of an obituary, if you care to make a donation, uh, you can do it to this um, Gardner Moment Prize. In, biology. So there, there are real, real potential for many different directions to people to contribute to the endowment fund. Yes. Could, could, I, I'm very eager to hear about uh, that gentleman who actually was helping you fundraise for the uh, other uh, fund because he, he, he is no longer with us. I reached out to his heirs and they are very happy to be to have been contacted. But I think among the many past presidents that we will interview, you're probably the one who would know him best. Could you share with us a little bit about him? Where did his interest come from in Turkish studies? Well, um, he was- Take this sort of initiative. It would be nice to also remember him. Yes, uh, he was very, um, kind and generous spirited person. And I think he was an anthropologist. I believe he founded the Department of Anthropology at William and Mary College. So for undergraduates, he was very interested in, in interacting with and helping undergraduate students. And I believe, uh, as I recollect, he, he uh, said that he had gone to Turkey as a consultant on someone else's project. And I think he just really like Turkey and he didn't like the fact that Turkey had sort of a bad reputation in the United States and the way to change it was to have undergraduates be able to experience the wonders of uh, and fascinations of traveling in Turkey or studying Turkish. So I think that was his motivation. He wasn't a Turkish scholar at all. I think he'd just been there and liked it and thought other people should have this opportunity. I mean, specifically, undergraduates. Amy, you look worried. <laughs> no, I'm just, I've, I've been thinking about the incorporation thing. I'm sorry. I got, <laughs> I got sidetracked thinking about that because I've also had conversations with Carter around the idea of fundraising and uh, thinking about setting up an endowment. And he, I think partly talked to me because I have done a fair amount of work on endowments. So he knows that my brain runs in that direction. Oh, good. <laughs> we need someone. So. <laughs> But I mean, I think that the idea is, um, I mean, it's, it's a good one if it can be sustainable uh, and certainly for thinking about ways to make fundraising attractive um, and having them be tax deductible is, is important. Um, plus is. Yeah. trying to, you know, but, but it's complicated because you have to have someone at least who's kind of always keeping an eye on it and thinks about, you know, how it should be invested and understands a little bit at least about investing and is willing to kind of do the regular work of checking in. I mean, it's not even a monthly activity. It's more like, you know, checking in every six months when you have an endowment just to see how things are doing. But, um, but it's interesting to know that, you know, it was, it was this, that there was an endowment set up a long time ago. So uh, yeah, maybe it could be broadened if you find out the specifics of the Holiday Deep Aldevar, now the Ulta 
prize. Right. Uh, right. And and so, I, I thought Carter's point about just you know using a Vanguard um, index fund, S and P mm -hmm. five hundred index fund. You know, in twenty years, that will have amounted to something, unless we were all, if we're all still here. The, uh, sure. Adivar Fund, which, uh, as you mentioned, uh, is likely going to be called OTSA Undergraduate Fellowship, um, is in a special fund. Uh, so it, we set, we keep that separate from our regular account. It's oh, yes. Under the care of a different agency, uh, because I know because I just recently had to sign a piece of paper to say, now our association has a new treasurer, I identify them. And so he will be the person of contact for the um, uh, institution that takes care of that fund. And it allows us to send uh, a student every year to Turkey from the proceeds. So we do not right. the fund itself. We use only the proceeds and that supports a visit to Turkey. Uh, we couldn't send anybody in 2020 because of COVID, we couldn't abort uh, anyone because of, due to COVID, nobody was going. But last year, we made up for it by awarding two students uh, to go to Turkey, who, who will both probably be visiting uh, this coming summer. And then uh, we'll put them in touch with the heirs of uh, the late uh, Professor Altshuler to let them know how they spend their time. And I think we will continue doing that every year. And it is a, one of our best, uh, sec most secure funds that we are really proud of. I wish we had more like that. Um, so we, Can I ask who, who is being, who is managing that fund? Is an we, don't manage, we don't manage it. It's, I, I know. Think, I think that there's a connection to a lawyer who um, has always managed it for Al Chiller himself, where he was the interface between us and Al Chiller. We got we get a financial report every year, but we have nothing to do with the with the financial management of the fund. Right, I'm not, I know that, but I was just curious um, because I, I was never informed. <laughs> how that was being uh i'm gonna look up my email as we speak and tell you the name of the company because i just happened to be in touch with it recently for this purpose um uh, but i would love to hear did uh professor Alt, Nate, the late professor nathan altshuler did he visit our meetings did oh yes he, he did uh, if you can tell us a little bit about him that'd be great because uh, this is a very good moment to sort of uh, think about him uh I had several dinners with him, and I, I sort of think one of them was in Madison, Wisconsin, but um, uh, he was just a very congenial, pleasant, easygoing, interested person, uh, but I don't have any facts about his academic um, interests, really, uh, other than I, I sense that he was very supportive of um, uh, promoting the uh, opportunities for undergraduate students at William and Mary or anywhere. So I can't help you very much. I mean, we get to the level of chit chat gossip. I don't, I don't, <laughs> and not that there's anything the matter with that, but I, I just, I, you know, I don't have anything to pull a, a store of knowledge other than that he was a very pleasant, gracious, uh, interested, decent person. That was my impression. So. Yeah. To answer your question, I just checked. The company is called Truist Wealth. So I guess it's a company that uh, specializes in wealth management. So yeah. T R U I S T, Truist, Truist Wealth. That is the. Yeah, I, I don't need to. Taking care of I'm not company. thinking of setting up an endowment for myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but it's so important that, you know, somebody being, there be a consistency in paying attention to you know, what is happening with sizable sums of money. Was he already interested in Adawar or uh, did, did some, uh, how, because I heard he also supported the publication of Adawar's memoirs, republication, that is. The, the, yeah, the, they were out of I didn't know about that, but he, uh, he'd never heard of her. And I said, uh, he said, you know, whom should this uh, prize be named for? And I said, well, look, they're all named for men. Let's think of a a woman to name it for. I didn't say Norhan Atasoy or 
Mubeja, Kurai, or any of these people. I thought, well, how about uh, someone who's passed away? Halide Deep Adavar, she has her memoirs in English, two volumes, and the second volume, The Turkish Ordeal, gives um, uh, you know, a full sweep of her changing opinions about things. And uh, he read it and was astonished and fascinated and thought, why isn't she known? And I said, well, I don't know. And uh, so he liked her two volumes. And apparently that second volume, he uh, correct, the republication of it, he, he had done, correct? Uh Yes, I, yes. It, 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 Sibel Erol, one of our members, I think it, she brought that to my attention about a year ago or so. Um, it, she had written maybe a preface for it. And if you look yes. at it online, you'll see that he supported it. Uh, he provided funds or something. So he helped uh, the republication. Uh, it, it was out of print. Uh, so there is one now, if you go on Amazon or somewhere uh, to find it, you'll find it there. Yes, that is mm -hmm. the case. Uh, this is uh, uh, before sort of more recent research into Adawar that brought her name to uh, various this conversations and sort of brought about the recent uh, vote uh, that we are actually at the moment, we don't exactly know, but uh, I find it likely that we will change the name, but it is good. It is good to have that uh, memory here uh, to both uh, remember uh, Professor Altshuler to remember why he found it interesting, how the name came up, because this is going to be the uh, sort of one uh, moment where we can talk about the award. So thank you. I appreciate. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mentioned, I mentioned, I suggested her and then he read her uh, memoirs and thought, wow, this is really interesting and important. And uh, it'd be good to have a prize named for this important personage. I think he also might've read the clown and his daughter which she had, uh, had written in English. Yeah, Amy? Um, so you rightly emphasized that, you know, fundraising is always uh, a kind of key concern of ours and something that we think about and, um, and try to figure out the best way to, to continue. But I wonder whether, you know, looking at OTS uh, over the past few years, you see other things that it seems to you deserve attention kind of in this moment that the organization hasn't got on its, you know, right in the center of its agenda or things that you see coming that you think might be worth really paying attention to. Because you do have this, this perspective um, of, you know, where we've been and what we've tried to do in the past and what succeeded and what hasn't. And um, just looking around today, what is it, what does it look like our organization might usefully be doing that it isn't yet doing? Well, I think you're doing so many things right now with the uh, possibilities presented by Zoom, having all those, uh, I mean, frequent uh, talks and lectures and uh, conferences on Zoom. I think that's marvelous. And uh, that's enough. What else? <laughs> What else could the poor president be doing? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, become, we go from one extreme to another. I mean, just so active uh, without having to travel around. It's just extraordinary, I think. But right. I don't, what, what kinds of areas were you thinking of? I, I don't know. I mean, it's one of the reasons I asked you because I obviously, you know, I have my own thoughts, but I, I always wonder, you know, how other people come to this and what they see when they look at the organization. I mean, for me, I think one of my kind of enduring questions is ways that we could perhaps be interacting more regularly with our European, Middle Eastern, Asian uh, colleagues. So, you know, there are several organizations of Ottoman studies in different parts of the world, um, or at least in the Northern hemisphere, I think by and large. And I, I sometimes wonder whether there are redundancies or whether there are ways in which we could have useful synergies that we're not thinking about or whether actually we're doing just fine. I think you're doing just fine. That's just, it's over, yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming. All the, Baki is sending out all these and he always says, uh, if you don't care to re read this all, don't read it all, you know. Uh, that there are extraordinary opportunities for 
um, scholars to communicate and um, react to one another at Zoom meetings such as this. I mean, I would much prefer to be sitting around the table and have a sub rosa seminar or something here, but, <laughs> but there are tremendous advantages to what has been imposed upon us. That is using Zoom, but don't you think? Listening to you, Sarah, I can I could see how crucial it must have been that TSA existed, which became OTSA in the 70s and 80s, because it sounds like in the absence of email and in the absence of um, other forms of quick communication that my generation kind of grew up with, in, starting from graduate school, uh, this organization was really everything that put people together. That's why I think it was so important to keep these newsletter going. I, I never uh, understood that as well as when you mentioned now, you know, email came and sort of before email, this was all, this was everything. You were going to Mesa and thanks to TSA, people were meeting, people were having panels, etc. Now we live in a very different age and I think absolutely uh, it, the, the jobs are advertised digitally. People see where to apply. People are already connected on Facebook with each other. Um, <laughs> uh, they don't necessarily need also to meet each other. But I think I thought it would be good to have a venue where uh, we could still uh, meet on a regular basis. And uh, I, I also try to bring people from uh, different continents together because Zoom allows that to happen. So I think it, it also is still can be a sort of virtual meeting place, but there are so many others. If you, if you go online and look at, you know, Facebook or Twitter or et cetera, you will see a barrage of announcements about, you know, this meeting here, this panel here. Because of Zoom now, you can take your time, go attend something in Vienna, Paris, Istanbul, et cetera. So it's a very, very radically different time than uh, the one, I guess, that when the, uh, Tulsa was founded in the 70s and then later in the yeah. 80s. Yeah, so yeah that, it, was, it was very different indeed and it's much improved. I mean, just a world of difference. One person I forgot whom I did interact with quite a bit was um, Roe Holbrook, Victoria Roe Holbrook, who was at Ohio State for a while and then uh, two of her MA students came here. Um, and uh, I think she's in Turkey uh, right now. I haven't kept up with her on Twitter, but too much. I, I reviewed her very impressive um, book on uh, <laughs> uh, Ottoman literature. It was good. She's she a very in interesting Istanbul. person. I beg your pardon? She's in Istanbul. I yeah. think for the most mm -hmm. part, she was until very recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, I was very, not very recently, but about a year ago in email touch with her for something. Uh, I had met her before I started my graduate school, um, sort of by chance in Turkey. Uh, and I, I was about to go to graduate school. Uh, and my graduate school is the one that she graduated from. And I also so happened to met her again once. So I knew her. That's why I was in touch with her. I think uh, she's around Bilgi University. Uh, at mm -hmm. least she does sort of talks, uh, sort of monthly or bi-monthly talks about different topics at Bilgi University. That she's another amazing literature scholar. Uh, mm -hmm. He um, who worked on the 18th century um, long poem, the the epic. Um, Oh my God, uh, the, the Mesnevi uh, mm -hmm. one of the uh, poets. And I, she also did the edition and Turkish translation of it that was published by MLA, uh, mm -hmm. which made it accessible. It is very difficult mm -hmm. text, the 18th century mm -hmm. text. Is it uh, Galib? Sheikh Galib. Yeah, Galib. Sheikh Galib, yeah. exactly. Sheikh Galib's romance. Um, and so it, it, it is sad, you know, that there are not a whole lot of people who do Ottoman literature. And I had found her work uh, very, very good. I, I, I wish uh, she stayed around uh, longer to teach at o Ohio State, but I think uh, she is living in Istanbul. And, and I, I'm not quite sure whether she pu publishes on Ottoman literature continuously, but that- Yeah, I've sort of lost uh, 
uh, lost contact with her, but I certainly enjoyed it while it lasted here. She was here, she gave a talk here, I guess, in, uh, where am I? I was gonna say Ann Arbor, <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. Right. Yeah. Beauty and so, love, beauty and love. Uh, which not, right. Uh, that, that is the uh, great piece, the, the, probably the latest great piece of Ottoman, classical Ottoman literature. And she right. had a great uh, book about it. And then later she also edited and translated it through MLA uh, publications. Um, yeah. You know, this circles back to what we were talking about before about Turkish language study in the US, because unlike, um, you know, many more sort of Western European languages and even East Asian languages, if you wanted to gain the kind of fluency, if you weren't um, an, uh, a a native Turkish speaker and you hadn't been learning Turkish from a very early age and you wanted to acquire the kind of fluency that's required in order to work on literature, you can't do, there are very few places in the US where you could say start Turkish as a freshman in your first year of university or even your second and do and have a sufficient number of years of study continuously with the possibility of summer courses so that you would graduate with the BA or even be able to do an MA and, and have achieved this really sophisticated knowledge of another language that it's certainly possible to do. And if you go to Turkey and you spend a lot of time there, it's possible, but it's much harder than say in French or in Arabic or Chinese or Japanese or Spanish certainly, or any one of a number of languages. It's easier to you know, acquire fluency in Latin and Greek <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure about that Chinese. <laughs> no, Chinese, I mean, you, can, you can start Chinese, you know, from day one in, in, in your college. And so by the time you graduated, you could have had, you know, four yeah, years yeah. of study in two summers and, right. I mean, that's, and spent a year in China. Yeah, so, we have a strong program here. Yeah. I hear yeah. the students practicing. We used to, you know, the, the tonal. <laughs> business yeah right this is not one of our regular questions but because of your um background and your experience uh, do, would you mind just telling us a little bit about the uh, other association you actually witnessed the foundation of the association of uh, american association you know, a -A -T -A -A. oh yeah american uh, association teachers of turkic languages yes 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 uh, well i think uh kathleen burrell was and it happened that Mesa meetings in maybe 1985 or something. And um, as I recall, there may have been several of us, but I, I said the second year, you know, this should be called not the American Association of Teachers of Turkish, but American Association of Teachers of Turkic Languages. Um, and everybody thought that was fine. And uh, it was important for having consistency in developing proficiency guidelines, which were essential for getting federal funding. And I also made it clear that it wasn't reasonable to have uh, literature people, his historians and social scientists uh, teaching Turkish by assigning what they were interested in reading to their students. <laughs> you know, it's just so cumbersome and not right. You know, it, it was important to have them, these two, disciplines that take very different skills separated, you know, so that you could um, really have a good career in uh, uh, Turkish um, language teaching according to contemporary uh, standards. And that's done very well and taken on. Erica Gilson has been working on that forever. Uh, Kathleen Burrell passed away some time ago, so. Um, and I remember someone uh, saying in one, of, maybe it was in that um, Turkish Studies Association at 25, that um, Kemal Karpat had gotten a room for Kathleen Burrell to have her meeting of Turkish language teachers uh, way back in, um, long before 1985. That had been sort of being thought about in the works. And, uh, but uh, yeah, it was largely, Erica Gilson and Kathleen Earl, and then Yulai Shamilo worked hard on that. Yeah. Um, 
I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I went to meetings, but I wasn't um, one of the major uh, participants in developing prof proficiency guidelines. Anything else? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess another question that comes to mind as we talk with you is we have been interviewing past presidents, all of whom were male so far. So you, yours is going to be the first interview with a past president who happens to be a woman. Uh, the, and maybe, I don't know, we, we, I'm sure you had a lot of, you had, you had a lot of experiences about being a woman in the American academe at the time that you were. I'm curious about whether or not it was more difficult to be a woman among people who study Turkish and Ottoman history, or did you end up finding it actually a little bit easier? Uh, you know, when you think about your experiences at, in, at Wisconsin in the university at establishment, and then your experiences at uh, TSA meetings, OTSA meetings, uh, et cetera, uh, were they equally sort of difficult or was it uh, was the field a little bit more welcoming? Would you have any insights on that? I suppose I do. <laughs> Uh, one thing I pre appreciate about Turkish scholars is male, is that they were, uh, they didn't really have in mind that I was a woman, for example, and that didn't make any difference. <laughs> uh, I, we were at a conference, SSRC conference in ba uh, Babalsar, Iran in 1978, and Carter Finley and me and Davis, Davison. Rod Davison, and I don't know if quite it was there or not. Halil Inaljik, and Nikki Keddy, and Gidi Nishad. <laughs> Do you know the, those people? Yeah, Nikki Keddy sons. <laughs> so, um, as usual, the um, chairman would introduce, and my colleague Steve Brown is going to present a paper on Luda, and then and then my lovely colleague <laughs> Nishad. <laughs> <laughs> Gidi Nishad is going. So Nikki Kedi had had enough and she complained about why are you referring to our physical appearance, gentlemen? And uh, we were, there was quite a vigorous discussion at an outdoor lunch setting, which I remember. And it was Halil Inaljuk was the only person who understood, got the point. And he, he settled the whole business by saying, well, uh, whoever it was, I'm not gonna, I'm sure uh, she would be happy to receive your compliments in a social setting, setting, but it's not appropriate in a professional setting. So here was this older Turkish scholar who you know, got the point and knew it. Uh, and that was the way he'd been brought up and helped people. And I, that's generally how I, how I found um, people in Turkish academic context, men and women. Uh, so, but in at University of Wisconsin, when Donna Shalala came, do you know about Donna Shalala as yeah. chancellor? Yeah, she's quite uh, bigger. She had uh, a gender equity review, and oh my goodness, you know, two the two women in our department, Ellen Raftery and I, and a couple of men, I guess, were on this committee, and we had access to the salaries and the you know CVs of people in comparable departments and across the board, men were, who were less productive than women were getting paid three and $4,000 more a year. And so that was fixed. But the next year when there were merit reviews, our male department chair said, well, you women were taken care of last year. <laughs> so we said, that's exactly how we got into this situation. So, I mean, there was that, that's rather, hmm. I don't know, I, I'm sure it has much improved since that was 19, Donna Shalala came in 1990, I think, for only two years. One good thing about being president of the Turkish Studies Association was that it impressed people within the university. So that then when I applied for funding as chair of Middle East Studies program, which I, I was, I was Chair of Middle East Studies program from 1990 to 1996, uh, which overlapped with being president of the Turkish Studies Association. It was impressive. So I was, I think it's easier for me to get funding for a conference. One of them was 
a quincentennial um, Sephardic Jewish life in the Ottoman Empire, 1492 to 1992. And also right after Leila Ahmed's book came out, um, I was able to organize a symposium using the title of her book. She came, Madeline Zilfi, I think Carl Petrie and uh, maybe Leslie Pierce, there were about eight people uh, who then got interviewed by Wisconsin Public Radio and aired, you know, that was a good feeling. But I think being president of the Turkey Studies Association, it gave me a little uh, help in applying for funding within my own department for um, good programs. I mean, good seminar and stuff, seminars, yeah. So that's an interesting observation because we just um, had decided, made a decision in the board that the position of secretary of ATSA should be renamed um, in part because what was contained in the position was clearly far beyond the scope of anything that might have been called secretary in the recent past. It was more reminiscent of secretarial duties several hundred years ago. And so the position of secretary is now called executive director. And oh. as I observed to our executive director, Carol Woodall, when I wrote, when she wrote to me this week about something and I sort of looked at the signature and I wrote to her and I said, you know, it makes an enormous difference. I see this email from you and it says, Carol Woodall, executive director. And it just, it just resonates much differently. And that was in fact, the point of making the change. Um, yeah, I'm glad you did it. <laughs> And, but I was astonished that even that I was impressed seeing that because, I mean, I was part of, you know, kind of making the change happen and, and it even affected me this just visually. So hmm. I think that, that you're right, that, that people, you know, who come to something, anything bearing a title, it's just a signal to whoever's, you know, uh, in the communication that pay more attention here. No, and pay more. <laughs> Just joking. Pay more. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, true. I, I was thinking when that issue first came up, it could be maybe Secretary General, as in Secretary General of the United Nations or something. But I think Executive Director is even more powerful. <laughs> yeah, I think we wanted to expunge the word Secretary altogether. That yeah. was part of the idea. Yeah. Was that it just it has too much baggage in it? It certainly does. Especially I'm in the generation where a uh, visiting scholars would come and I'd be in the office waiting to be introduced and they uh, could use their access, please. <laughs> I need to have, you know, or when the Dalai Lama came the first time um, here, would you help serve the punch? <laughs> you know, and so, <laughs> Because I was, you know, ancillary duties. So when I, so in my previous job in Tel Aviv, I would sometimes make a phone call to another faculty member or to the dean's office. And if it was somebody who was in a big department, they routed their calls through their administrative office. And the dean never answered his own phone anyway. And I found that when I called, uh, I would often, you know, be mistaken for someone else's secretary. <laughs> so I would say, you know, I'd like to, this, this is Professor So and So. I'd like to speak to the to the dean, and they would say, um, "and and what is it about?" And it was like, "No, <laughs> I'm the professor. I'd like to speak to the dean, and I don't want you to pre-screen my calls." And and then there would just there all these sort of very funny things about assuming that if it was a woman calling, it couldn't possibly be the person with the title. Yeah. So and that's still happening. No, oh, no, that's no. it. Yeah, that a lot of these things have um, we've moved beyond, but of course, then there's the backlash. So uh, we'll see what happens. I was just uh, looking for uh, Victoria Rowe Holbrook, but I got such a sweet comment from her. I, I reviewed that amazing book, and she told me you're the only person so far who's gotten it. <laughs> the point. And uh, gotten the point of how she was quoting from Gallup um, mm -hmm. for certain sections that tied in there. Anyway, it was uh, The Unreadable Shores of Love. That's the title of it. The Unreadable Shores of Love. 
uh, Turkish Modernity and Mystic Romance, 1994. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's when I wrote the review, but yeah, that's a very powerful book. Right, and to, just to sort of f close the circle around um, what she's doing these days. So I pulled up um, a bio of her, actually. It's something uh, from something from Istanbul. So she has been translating and um, she translated White Castle, which I think she must have done a while ago. And then Quite a while she ago. translated yeah. something called The New Cultural Climate in Turkey by Nordan Gürbilek. And then oh, no. uh, she's tr she translated Listen, The Spiritual Couplets of Mevlana Rumi by Kenan Rifai. And something forthcoming, which is a com something called O oh Mankind, which is a commentary on the Quran by Jamal Noor Sargut. And this is part of an advertisement for a talk in 2020. So this must be fairly recent. Hmm. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing like uh, Google. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. I mean, you can yeah. really catch up with people. And but you, you seem can to be quite active. Yeah, well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. I've moved off into, uh, Alan Fisher was talking about telling stories, that if we don't tell the stories, those people are going to vanish. And it's not, not, not right. So I, I have a collection of things that, that need to be strung together and made into a story. I've been trying to get my, focus my attention on that. Yeah. Do you have one in particular you'd like to share with us? No, well, I don't want to fess up to not having taken care of these things already. I have the um, the journal that um, a young woman, maybe 19, kept when she crossed the ocean and traveled in Europe because she was sending a, being sent abroad by her parents during the American Civil War so that she'd forget about that hick from Connecticut. <laughs> but fortunately, she didn't forget about that hick from Connecticut. <laughs> she was from New York City. Um, she married him, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But I also have uh, uh, other things of hers that uh, somehow should be, you know, treated as a group. And, and then there's the passport of uh, someone who went around the world in 19, uh, 1937, a woman, um, well, she went to Transjordan, she went to Egypt, she went to Finland, she went through the Soviet Union. Um, I asked Kim Ogbe what, uh, whether there had been some women's conference going on that she was going to visit these different places. No, I think she was just curious. <laughs> uh, so, and then there, I have letters from hers. And I don't, I'm, that's not as interesting as uh, some other items that have come down to me from the same uh, you know, some relatives, a woman who uh, created a sampler that said, Sarah, be faithful to improve thy mind, respect thy parents, thy friends be kind, which was recited to me throughout my childhood whenever my mother wanted me to do something that I, was a task that wasn't particularly loving. And it was signed 1830. And I just recently discovered that the, um, sampler we didn't know anything about, Julie Ann Crane, that my sister has, signed 1812, was the mother of the woman in the sampler I have. But I also have other things of hers, like, you know, a little Bible, a, a autograph book, mm -hmm. acrostic poems from 18, um, 35 and 45 before she was married. I, I have um, photographed them. I haven't Xeroxed them, but they should be all of these things should be strung together uh, so that the next generation knows about them or that they'll be given to you know, a collection like this um, um, museum. This is for another side of the family in New Milford, Connecticut, where that wonderful hit came from. <laughs> Were you the so, first person in your family ever to have any contact with Turkey? Yes, I think so, which is different also. I think so. It's interesting to watch also in the progression of officers and participants uh, in TSA and then ATSA, the, the shifting balances of 
people who either came from Turkey were had Turkish heritage uh, and who became involved in the organization and the way that even Ottoman Turkish studies in the US has become gradually um, more populated by people who have either family or deep previous personal connections to the Ottoman world, to Turkey, not, not all Turkish, um, mm -hmm. who connect with the Ottoman world in, in very personal ways. And I think that this is, this is really a marked change. Um, and that it may be true, not only in Ottoman and Turkish studies, but also in Arabic, uh, Persian studies, um, compared to say, you know, 40 years ago when I was, you know, starting my studies. Um, so that, that, uh, that's really struck me of late. Um, yeah. It so. is interesting. Now, as I mentioned, um, the generation before me, well, like, Harold, Howard Reed uh, Davidson and his wife was something marvelous <laughs> too, Louise. She came to Babel, Babel sorry, also in Iran, <laughs> went around together, the markets and things. And also um, Engin uh, Akarlu, then is his God, we had a nice time. <laughs> I don't know, that doesn't connect in with what we were just saying, but I, I, Davison did have some prior, um, I, I think, Protestant connection with, mm -hmm. uh, with the Ottoman world. Right. Which I didn't, um, as far as I know. <laughs> well, no, because right. I was just thinking, actually, there's a, uh, some um, gardener uh, buried in... Um, a cemetery in Cairo and there were locals who I saw a little squib of a newspaper thing locals came to you know this is about 1901 or something or maybe even before that uh they were locals in attendance <laughs> for his funeral so I don't I don't know anything about that that person and then there was someone named Gardner that uh uh Bernard Lewis pointed out to me a scholar of um, a great Islamic mystical writer from about uh, Ten hundred. I can't hmm. remember. I'd have to look that up. Uh, we, probably. I mean, there are not very many gardeners. G A I R D N E R S in the world. But as far as I know, I had no connections with mm -hmm. Islamic world or <laughs> Turkey, except from my own um, travels right. there. Yeah. And so then, um, what else? Nothing else. Oh, uh, we, we didn't follow the exact question line that we had, but I think I have a feeling that we covered pretty much all of the questions in one way or another. That's the feeling I get. But Amy, please double check and correct me if I'm uh, missing anything important. I guess we have uh, questions that we didn't ask, but by sharing what you shared, you already answered them sort of like important things while you were president. Uh, anything that right. you have to share? And I think you did, I mean, your contribution to our association in terms of our financial help is beyond any other president, I can tell you, because our main uh, and one and only endowment is the endowment that you established. Well, so in that sense, uh, we are grateful to you. And no matter what the endowment will be called, um, and I think I must say it is uh, going to be more appropriate to call it uh, OTSA. If, uh, even oh, I, I think so too, to call them all OTSA that puts yeah, the organization exactly, up in front. Exactly, because last, I mean, I, I'll, let me share with you why I came to that more, much more forcefully. Uh, last, uh, in our last annual meeting, when we announced it, one of the winners of the uh, Adobar Prize uh, was Sam Tristan. Uh, he happens to be a Navajo. Um, uh, at, uh, I think, Georgetown, uh, a student, undergraduate student of Navajo background. So when you think about that institution that Adwar was associated with, no matter how Adwar herself might have felt about the, uh, the students uh, and the orphans that she was working with, and I do actually believe she improved their lives while she was there, the association itself uh, the, 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 the institution itself is a very problematic institution. So we are giving this award to a, a student, Native American student, whose 
uh, ancestors sort of uh, relationships with American government or in Canada, you know, we recently talked about these schools where people are sort of cut from their past to be re-educated, to become white Americans or Canadians, etc. To have that sort of an institution in one of our prizes uh, is just going to be, was going to be uh, problematic, no matter from whichever aspect we uh, want to look at. Um, so I think it's going to be a good move. And the, 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 uh, although I don't really know what the vote will be, on, uh, we'll see the result on Monday, but I anticipate we will change it. And uh, I think uh, no matter the name will be, we will continue giving the award every year to students, to deserving students. And it's going to be always, we'll always remember you because you were the one who established the uh, uh, endowment. And it is uh, our the healthiest thing. Uh, when we look at our financial report every quarter, we have a separate account for this. It says how much money there is, and it is there. It's there to stay. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Well, for doing thank that. you, uh, uh, Altshuler, Nathan, <laughs> a very generous spirited um, alert person who like Turkey and Turks a lot because he traveled there, I think is how that comes to. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, it's been very pleasant meeting with you. I wish it were in person. I hope we can get together sometime. It's been wonderful to, to have you on camera this time. That's been actually a tremendous, I think, shift. So I'm glad that we were able to do this. Yeah, so am I. All righty. Well, I'm off to my other a Zoom meeting of uh, um, classmates from college. <laughs> uh -huh. Great, great. Is that great. ever fun? <laughs> that sounds like great fun. It great is. Fun. Thank the you same so much thing. for making time for us. Thank you. Of Thank course. You of course. Thank you so much. Enjoy Take care. your weekend. You also. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.